Good morning, everyone. We all stand as we move into a time of worship. Goodbye to shame. Goodbye to the way things used to be. Goodbye to regret and bitterness. Goodbye to apathy. Goodbye to business as usual. Goodbye to the lies that deceived us. Goodbye to whatever is holding us back. And hello to freedom in Jesus. Say hello to a second chance. Hello to a firm foundation. Say hello to mercy and new possibility. Hello to the gift of salvation. Say hello to a father who adores you. Hello to the son who redeemed us. Say hello to the Holy Spirit, our comforter, and the resurrection power within us. This is not hype or wishful thinking. This is not clever branding. This is where we find true, full forgiveness and peace beyond understanding. Welcome to a promise that never fails. Welcome to an everlasting hope. The creator of the universe is speaking. You belong here. Welcome home. Welcome to the life abundant. Welcome to your true worth. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to church. Set that up. 
thank you for worshiping. You guys can have a seat. We're going to move into a time of communion. First, let me say thank you. You are the responsible service. We threw you a curveball. We changed the time. And I'm going to say 80% of you all are here on time. Those who are coming in in a few minutes, they'll realize that we have an abbreviated service today and, they, and we didn't offer communion. Um, but my point is this. Change can be difficult sometimes, a lot of times. Most of the times, we, we sort of resist change, okay? I mean, we had um, the time change. We adjusted that, and then we did like a church time change. And that, and that can be difficult. But I want you to notice something out of Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 7. There's a, there's a change that has happened among Christ's followers. This is what is written about Paul and, and his life. It says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking to midnight. Now, go back and read Acts chapter 20. Fascinating story. He preaches. Some guy falls out of a window. Um, but here's what I want us to focus on. On the first day of the week, they came together for this time. They came together to break bread. And what you have to understand is the first day of the week of the Jewish calendar is Sunday. And the last day, the day of rest, Sabbath, is Saturday. And they shifted their focus on God from Saturday to Sunday. And you might say, well, why did they do that? And it's relatively new as recorded in the book of Acts. What happened? Well, Jesus changes everything. His resurrection on Sunday was so sacred, so special, that they decided to begin worshiping God on Sunday. And they moved they're gathering together, their feast to Sunday. And that's why we eat and drink every week to remember the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Such a significant moment that it changed how we do church. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that happened that we've been celebrating, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not just his resurrection, but his death, the payment in full for our wrongdoing, our rebellion against you. There's no animosity if we'll just receive the act of Christ on the cross, if we'll accept his death as punishment. Not that we would keep on sinning, God, but that we would know that you're not mad. There's no anger towards us. It was poured out on Jesus. Man, that changes everything. Thank you that we get to celebrate that. We remember the body and the blood as we eat and we drink. May you allow this time to transform us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning, church. Let me invite you to stand. We're going to sing one more time before we hear the message today. Something just as Robin was leading us in communion, I thought, you know, when they, when they made that shift, it's the first day of the week, I just thought they got to put Jesus first. They got to put Jesus first on their mind. And let me encourage you to do that. I know that's so difficult with all of the things that we have going on in our lives, all the deadlines, everything. But he commands us, he pleads with us, he asks us to make him first in our lives and everything because he has won the greatest victory as we're just about to sing. Come on, let's not hold back. Let's sing with everything we have. Let's worship him. Let's pray to him. Let's just be with him today, church.
Jesus. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. That was a, that was a good, good morning. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, hey, we are a week past Easter. I really hope uh, that y'all were here last Sunday. Y'all were joining with us as we celebrated the risen Savior. It was an amazing morning from our graveside uh, service, uh, our sunrise service out at the graveside uh, to here. We had uh, really like packed services. It was really awesome. Just the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, a good Sunday. We really hope that you took part in that. Um, so I knew I was going to be preaching this Sunday, just uh, trying to, to help Steve uh, relieve some of the, the things going on in his life. Uh, you know, we've been praying for him uh, and Beverly, the loss of Beverly's mom, and then some sickness last week. And so uh, I kind of knew what I was going to be preaching on uh, well in advance. And I was thinking to myself, what do you preach on after Easter? Like, what, what would be a good, like, post Easter message, and so um, instead of relying on the Holy Spirit to guide me, I, um, I googled, <laughs> what do you preach on after Easter? <laughs> Not my finest moment. Uh, <laughs> I should have, uh, should have relied on the Spirit. Um, did Google help me out? No, uh, Google did not help me out. Uh, I, I needed guidance. Why did I go to Google? I don't know. Maybe because I'm a millennial and that's what millennials do. I don't know. Should have relied on the power of the Spirit. Uh, without any help from Google, I decided to then uh, work through the Spirit to, to give me some guidance, give me some insight. And as I was thinking about this and, and listening to Robin last Sunday, the idea of, of doubts started to creep into my mind. We, we heard last week through Robin's message that there were early church fathers, these disciples, these kind of like titans of the early church. They wrestled, they struggled with doubt, they had doubt. Even though they had all the evidence in the world to believe, they still struggled with doubt. And, and, and probably like them, you and I, we struggle with doubts as well. They struggle with doubt until they encounter Jesus after his resurrection. And, and maybe, we, maybe we do identify. Maybe there's this sense within all of us that, that we have doubts about Jesus. We have doubts about his death, his resurrection. We want to believe and we want to be fully devoted to Jesus Yet sometimes these doubts, they just, they just take up space in our head, and they keep us from taking the necessary steps to jump into full devotion. So today, question for all of us, how do we go from doubts to devotion? How do we, how do we go from navigating the doubts and the questions that we have about Jesus and go to full devotion, being sold out? living by faith, worshiping Him, giving Him our lives, uh, our all in all. How, how do we do that? That's the question this morning. And I, my guess is that there's some of you here who have never given Jesus your life, and, and you have doubts, you have questions, you have these things in your head that, that you think keep you in the doubts and will not allow you to go into devotion. They're keeping you from making that decision, and you're wrestling with those. You're like, how, how can I just get past... I have this question, how can I just get past this? Is it possible to get past this question, this doubt that I have, to go into full devotion? And if you're here this morning, that's you. Thank you for being here. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome. If you have given your life to Jesus and you struggle, maybe you, you've given your life to Jesus, you know who he is. He is your Lord and he is your Savior. But there's still doubts, there's still questions. Did, did, did you really die and, and rise on the third day? Did he really do all these things that we have recorded in Scripture? Is the Bible, is that really God's Word? Should, should I believe everything that's in there? And, and maybe there's doubts and, and questions, and you've given Jesus your life, but maybe you're not fully devoted. You're not fully sold out. There's still doubts and questions. You're living in doubts and questions, but you're, you're also living in somewhat devotion, but you're not fully sold out. Hey, if that's you this morning, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. 
I've been a Christian for 26 years of my life, and um, I gave my life to Christ early on, but um, I, I still struggle with doubts and questions. I went to Bible college for four years. I've been in ministry for uh, almost 11 years now, and, and I still have doubts. I still have questions. H- how is that possible? H- how can someone who's given their life to Jesus and, and done all of these things, how, how can I have doubts in my life? Well, there's an element of faith. I, I don't have all, the que- uh, have all the answers to the questions. There's an element of faith, but there's still doubts that I struggle with in my life. I don't know if you believe in love at first sight. Um, I do. Uh, I believe in love at first sight because it was love at first sight for me when I saw her shooting a basketball one Saturday afternoon at the church that we went to. My dad ran this basketball league uh, for kids and for students at First Christian Kernersville for several years. And, and as I was refing this game, it was halftime, uh, and I happened to just be on the edge of this of the court where this tall, lanky brunette was shooting basketball, and my eyes were locked on. I was like, who is this girl? I have got to get to know her. It was love at first sight for me. I was watching in amazement, just jump shot after jump shot that she took. I'm like, this girl loves sports. I love sports. This girl's good looking. I'm not good looking, but we'll make it work. (laughs) I had to get to know her. It was my mission to get to know her. We were both in high school, and I'd seen her in youth group. Now, our youth group was, was big. We had about 100-plus kids in our high school and then another 100-plus in our middle school. So, like, I had seen her, I had noticed her, but I didn't know anything about her. But I'd made the connection. We were in youth group together, and I had to get to know her. And like every awkward high school boy who thinks they have game but have none, I, too, thought I had game and had none, Okay. I was kind of helpless. I thought I knew what it took to, to wow women. I had no idea what it took to wow women. But I was going to try my hardest. Doubts ran through my mind. Questions. Would this girl acknowledge my existence if I approached her? Would she think I'm good looking? Would she go on a date with me if I asked her to? Would this work out? Was I wasting my time? I had doubts. Would any of this be worth it? Would it be worth it? Was I just wasting my time? In the midst of doubt, other questions ran through my mind. What if it did work out? What if she did say yes? What if she did want to go on a date? What if she did think I was good looking? Was this a waste of time? Maybe it wouldn't be. I had to try. Those questions fueled my intention, and so my devotion Uh, began to grow more and more, and that devotion fueled my energy to winning her over no matter what it took. I started hanging out with her friend group at church. Anywhere she was, I had to be. Our, Our friend groups would do things together on Friday and Saturday night, so when she was there, I was there. I had to be there. I asked her on a date to East Coast Wings in Kernersville. I thought it went great. She said it was a disaster. It was a train wreck. I thought it was great. Her parents (laughs) made her go. (laughs) I found that out of just, hey, be nice to him. Just go go on a date with him. Just be nice to him. And then if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I thought it went great. She said it was a train wreck. (laughs) I texted her as often as I could. And, And if you... Lived in the age before unlimited calls and texts, you'll remember that, that sent text messages were like 10 cent and received text messages were like 5 cent. Y'all, y'all remember that? Yeah, we ran our parents' phone bill. Well, I ran the phone bill up. Uh, she just texted me out to be nice back. But we ran our parents' phone bills up. I gave her gifts for Christmas and her birthday, and she accepted them only to put them in her closet later, as I found out. I invited her to school dances, and she reluctantly went with me. It's not, once again, I'm not proud of this, okay? It was her birthday. I I had my mom bake her a cake as we were hanging out with friends, and we got there to the party, and I had this cake, and I'm like, I baked this cake for, she saw right through my lies. She knew I didn't bake the cake, but I told everyone I baked the cake for her birthday. I was so devoted to this girl. 
who won my heart on the basketball court. And it took several years for Whitney finally to give in and to say yes to my advances, four plus years to be exact. And I had doubts over the course of that time that it would work out, but I was fully devoted to winning her over, to be in a relationship with her. My devotion, it never, it never subsided. It never waned. Even though I had doubts, I was still committed and devoted to my love for her. As Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, after his resurrection, he tells his, disi- his disciples to meet him one last time. Listen to what Matthew says in chapter 28, verses 16 through 17. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Some doubted. These guys had, had all the evidence in the world to believe in Jesus. They had been with him for three years. They had seen the miracles. They had heard the teachings. They would even heard him say numerous times, hey, I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back. They had all the evidence in the world, and yet in this moment, some still doubted. The, the disciples' response is, is kind of puzzling, right? Like we would, we would expect it to be that of, of skepticism and, and disbelief, but actually it's, it's uncertainty, it's indecision. Here's, here's the thing about this, though. The disciples left room for devotion in the midst of their doubts. It's how they were able to worship on this mountain while still having doubts. It's why they were with him on that mountain to begin with. Hey, this is crazy. Is this, is, like, is this really it? Is this, is this Jesus? Is this the guy? Is this the Messiah? Is this who he claims to be? We're still going to worship him. We're still going to be here with him. He's called us here. We have to be there with him. It's how they were able to listen to his final command, which we're going to read in a second. It's how they were able to listen to it and fulfill the great commission after his ascension. There was doubt, yet there was faith and devotion at the same time. And here's the thing. Our doubts become devotion when they're accompanied by action. I may have doubted that Whitney and I would ever end up getting together and staying together, but I also had faith that we would. I had to do what it took. I I had to do things to show her my love and my devotion to her. It took action. It took action to, to subside the doubts and allow devotion to prove my love to her. Jesus gives the disciples a way to move from doubt to devotion through this final command found in verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus, knowing that his disciples, his followers, are teeting on doubt and devotion, puts the ball in their court. He commands them, hey, go. If you believe in who I am and my mission, then go and make disciples all over the place. Would they stay stuck in doubt and do nothing, or would they allow their devotion to take place as they take action to make Jesus known? We know that they chose to fulfill the Great Commission, right? We wouldn't be here if they didn't. And in doing so, they went from doubts to devotion. They made it their life's mission to let Jesus be known all over the place. Because the disciples were devoted to Jesus, they taught others about him, and the church exploded. We pick up the story in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. This is the, the story of the early church. The, the first part of Acts is all about the early church and, and its uh, founding and, and how they lived and what they did. We read about this early church and their devotion of the believers and their relationship with Jesus. If we're to go from doubts to devotion, we too must model our faith after those of these early believers. If you were part of our men's breakfast a couple of months ago, uh, we brought in a guy, Kevin McNeil. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. I've known Kevin for a long time. 
Uh, he's one of our church planners in Goldsboro at Canvas Church. He came in and he told us, he challenged us uh, at this breakfast to own our growth. Own our growth. Man, I, I love that <laughs> so much because it, it puts the ball in our court. Own your growth. In Acts 2, 42 through 47, we see this idea of spiritual ownership and growth at its finest. Let's read what these early church followers of Jesus did to, to devote themselves to him. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was, was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, moving from doubts to devotion requires being in God's word and communicating with him. So go back to 42, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were devoted to hearing and knowing God's word. How often do we take time to read our Bibles? How often do we take time to, to be in a sermon, to hear God's word? How often do we have Bible studies where we're intently focused on God's word and knowing what it says and applying it to our lives, either individually or in a group setting? The early church followers were devoted. They were devoted on hearing the apostles teach about Jesus. And this was their only source of knowledge, only source of spiritual growth. And they were eating it up. They couldn't get enough. They were devoted every single day. And if we want to move from doubts to devotion, we need to know what God's word says. And we need to be in it all the time. But not only do we need to know God's word and know what it says, we have to hear from God. We have to communicate from God as well. You can't have a successful relationship without communication. If we want to be devoted, we have to spend time in prayer. The more we talk to God, the more we find ourselves being devoted to him. He desires to hear from us. And we need to take time to hear from him as well. It's not enough just to pray. We have to take time and quiet to, to listen, to know what he wants to say, to know what he has to say to us. It's hard to be devoted to something when you don't spend time and you don't know the things about a person or the thing you're being devoted to. Being, devoted, being in God's word and communicating to him in prayer helps us know him more and helps fuel our devotion. The second thing this morning is moving from doubts to devotion requires community. Verses 44 through 45 say, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. The support system in Christian community is really unlike anything there is in the world. And maybe if you're a part of that community, you know that. You believe that. You've experienced that. You've witnessed that. The early church followers of Jesus desired to be together, and they took care of each other. And when we find ourselves in Christian community, it spurs us to see other people succeed as they are spurring us on to succeed as well. And doubts become devotion when we want each other to have meaningful relationships with Jesus. And I, I love this church. Um, I tell people all the time, this church is probably one of the most selfless giving churches when, when there's a need within this church. If you're in a Sunday school group or a life group, you've probably been a part of, of helping someone in their time of need, either through prayer, through going to visit them, through giving meals, through financial support, whatever it is. This church helps each other out, just like that early church did in Acts. I love that. And when Whitney and I have gone through painful and difficult times in life, we too have experienced that kind of love, that kind of community, as y'all have come around us to take care of us in our time of need. It's that selflessness and that love that deepens our devotion to God. And when people have asked, hey, do you need anything? I'm like, oh, my church family, they've got me. 
And that's an amazing thing. It, it spurs our devotion to God when we're taking care of each other, when we're putting ourself aside, becoming selfless, and taking care of those in our community, taking care of them and putting their needs first. When we take time to love and to care and to serve others, we're living out the kind of devotion that God desires for his followers. And the last thing this morning, moving from doubts to devotion requires consistency. Acts 2.46 says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They devoted, excuse me, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. It's hard to be devoted to something without consistency. Devotion fades and doubt creeps in without consistency. Luke says that these early church followers of Jesus met daily in the temple courts. Why would they do that? Why would you daily devote yourself to something? Well, it's all about being consistent. We meet every Sunday morning for a service and for life groups. We have quarterly Wednesday night life group sessions throughout the year. And despite all of these options for people to be here, not everyone takes advantage of these opportunities. Church attendance used to be, hey, if you're here every single Sunday to, yeah, I'm here maybe once a month. <laughs> we want to create and sustain devoted followers of Jesus here at Jefferson. From our kids' ministry to our student ministry to our adult ministry, we want to come alongside of people who have doubts and lead them to devotion. But like Kevin said, you also have to own your growth. Being consistent in your daily Bible study, being consistent in your prayer time, being consistent in community is vitally important. And as much as I want all of us to be consistent, as much as I want you all to be here as, as often as we're here, I can't force anyone. <laughs> Steve, Robin, Derek, Chrissy, we can't force anyone to be here. Doubts will continue to, to reign supreme in your head if you're not being consistent in your walk with Jesus. Devotion grows in consistency. Last year, we celebrated 26 lives uh, given to Jesus. It, it, it was awesome. It was like every, every week we were like, hey, someone's given their life to Jesus. It was, it was incredible. 26 decisions for Christ here at Jefferson. Here's what's, what's more impressive. Most of those were first-time decisions, and some of those were rededications. Almost all of them were friends and family members coming alongside of those wanting to give their lives to Jesus and baptizing their friends and their family members. That's awesome. I tell people all the time, if I never get the opportunity to baptize another person, but a family member or a friend gets to, I will be a-okay with that. If you are a devo devoted follower of Jesus, your devotion should spur you on to lead other people to that same devotion that you have. If you're guiding your friends and your family members into a relationship with Jesus, your doubts are quenched and your devotion is fueled, right? Fulfilling the Great Commission makes you more devoted to Jesus when you bring your friends and your family from those doubts to devotion. And while 26 baptisms here is impressive, there's a bigger picture that, that maybe you don't know about. See, Jefferson's mission, our, our outreach, is focused on church plants. We know that we can only accomplish so much here at this property. We know that there are people there are places, there are cities in North Carolina where there's not a strong church presence. And we know that there are lives that need to be influenced for Jesus for the better. And so Jefferson's mission is to make church plants possible in these areas. We have a few church plants, uh, some that are relatively new, some that are going very strong. Jefferson is committed to fulfilling the Great Commission and as you give to Jefferson, you are partnering with us to fulfill the Great Commission by helping these church plants get going in these areas. Now listen to some of these stats from our church plants. At our newest church plant, Collective, uh, you might remember Corey uh, Pelegi. Last year he came up and he preached during the summer. Uh, Corey Pelegi is the church planter there in Kinston. 
Uh, they've had eight people give their lives to Jesus. They just launched in January. They've kind of been a church uh, getting their, their feet going for about a year now, but they've had eight decisions for Jesus, people giving their lives to Jesus, and you were a part of that. Uh, at Jacksonville, Restore, Roger Burns, they've had 114 people give their lives to Jesus and be baptized. 14 of those 114 have been this year alone. You are a part of that. And then in Goldsboro, at Canvas, uh, with my friend Kevin McNeil, they've had 73 baptisms, and he told me that there are two more happening today. You are a part of that. Your devotion to Jesus is allowing other people to become devoted followers of Jesus as well. And I, I wrestle with this. Um, you know, this sermon might kind of sound works-based, like you have to do these things in order to be a committed and devoted follower of Jesus, um, but it's not. Why, why would anyone be devoted to something that they didn't believe in or have faith in, right? It kind of sounds ridiculous. Why, why would anyone do that? The disciples had, to, had a make-or-break moment on that mountain with Jesus. They spent nearly three years of their lives with him, they had heard his teaching. They would followed him. They experienced difficulty. They served with him. They did everything with him. They learned from him. They left their jobs, their family, status, reputation. They left it all to follow him, and they did it on faith. The last semester of my um, high school uh, senior year, I was to meet with my guidance counselor, and, and everyone does this. You know, you meet with your guidance counselor, they ask you what your plans are after high school. Um, they like to help you make decisions, inform decisions, and all that good stuff. And uh, for them, they like to know how many kids are graduating, you know, who's going to college, who's going to um, go and get a trade, all this stuff. So I'm meeting with my guidance counselor, and uh, of course, the question arises what do you plan to do after you graduate? And I'd already committed uh, to go to Johnson, uh, then Bible College, now Johnson University. And I'd, I'd committed to going into ministry. Um, and so as she asked me that question, what, so what are your plans after high school? I said, well, I'm going to Johnson Bible College and I'm going to study youth ministry and preaching. And you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> she kind of made a hmm noise. And she said, Really? Bible college? Ministry? I said, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. She said, huh, you could do so much more with your life. Why, why would you do that? And I honestly, I, I was left speechless. I mean, I, I wish I had a, a solid answer. I wish I, could have, wish I could have told her how God had called me into ministry and how I knew so firmly that this was my decision because of his leading and his guidance and his direction in my life, but I just kind of stood there, silent, and then doubt <laughs> creeped into my, my brain. Was I, was I making the right decision? Was I, was I basing my livelihood, my career on something that, man, what if, what if this isn't, what if she's right? Like, what if, what if all this is not real. <laughs> and I'm basing my livelihood on something that isn't real. What if I don't believe that this is what I should do? What if I don't believe in it as strong as I should? I could do so much more. What, what am I doing? And I sat there. And I just, yeah, this, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Bible college. I'm going to go into ministry. But the doubt was, man, it was so loud in my head. I could do so much more and, and, and do something in, in my livelihood wouldn't be in jeopardy if this wasn't, wasn't real and it wasn't true. She kind of told me that my future plans were going to be a waste of time. I could do something more meaningful with my life. I could be anything, go anywhere in her eyes, and what I was planning to do was a waste. And I tried to be as confident as I could and tell her that this is what God had called me to do conversation and I, and I walked out the door. Just like the disciples, I had a make or break moment. Would I allow the doubt that was ringing in my head become true? 
would that be it? <laughs> or the little bit of faith that I had in the call that God had placed on my heart be louder? I had left room for devotion. And I did exactly that. Went off to Bible college for four years, studied ministry. And I'm here today. <clears throat> do I have doubts today? Yeah, I do. I don't have all the answers. But I have to have faith. But my devotion to Jesus is greater than my doubts. The disciples had that make or break moment. They saw Jesus. They still doubted. Could have been easy for them to say, yeah, Jesus, it's been fun. <laughs> we got doubts. We're not sure if this is still worth it. We can go back to fishing. We can go back to being tax collectors. We can go back to being zealots. Or we can, we can fulfill the Great Commission. We can do what you say. The disciples risked everything out of devotion to Jesus. Their faith allowed for such devotion. We see the impact that devotion for Jesus can have. That devotion is built on faith, great or small. And this morning, I don't want you to leave here this morning and, and allow the doubts that are in your head to get the best of you. How do we go from doubts to devotion? Well, like Kevin said, we kind of have to own our growth, right? Doubts become devotion when accompanied by action. Get to know who God is by reading his word, by being in regular communication with him through prayer. Be committed to community, to be with fellow believers, to love, to serve, to grow in your relationship as you're loving and serving those in your community. And do all of this consistently. Doubts grow stronger when you allow them to. Devotion is fueled when you're consistently doing things that keep you connected to Jesus. Don't leave here this morning without owning your growth. <clears throat> if you need some help with that, uh, I would love to talk with you. Robin, Steve, we would love to talk with you this morning. We would love to see your doubts turn to devotion this morning. Let's pray. God, I don't have all the answers, and, and sometimes I do have, I have doubts, I have questions. But I also know that without faith, I can just let those doubts and those questions reign supreme in my mind. And there is the element of faith. There is an element of trust. And God, I've seen the goodness of, of who you are as my devotion for you is, is fueled. And that, that is my hope for those in, in this room this morning. Maybe if they've got doubts and they've got questions and Maybe they want to be fully devoted. Maybe they're wrestling with that. How, how can I be fully devoted to something that I'm not entirely sure about? God, we got to have faith. But we also can't just stay in our doubts. If we want to see something different, maybe we need to put some action into place to get to know you better. And I know that as, as we grow in our knowledge of you and our understanding of you, as we pursue you more, our devotion will become so strong and we will see your goodness through that. So I pray this morning, if there's any decisions that need to be made, God, that, that decisions would be made. That we wouldn't just stay in our doubt, God, but that we would move towards devotion. Out of your love for us, by Jesus dying on the cross, God, may we fuel that same love, passion, and devotion today. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Um, yeah, there's doubts. There's questions. And, and maybe, like I said earlier, you have not stepped out in faith and given, given Jesus your life. Maybe because you think the doubts and the questions are, are too strong to overcome. I don't have all the answers, but I can certainly help you with those. Steve, Robin, myself, we would love to help you with that this morning. If you want to know Jesus, maybe you want to step out and say, yeah, I want to try something different. Maybe I've been sitting in doubts and, and questions, but maybe I need to move into devotion. Come and talk to us. We'll, we'll be over here on the side. We'd love to talk with you this morning as we sing this song. Y'all stand as we sing.
on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generation. I know that you will keep the covenant. I'm calling on the God of
You guys can have a seat for just a second. Uh, first, let me say this. It was a busy, busy moment there. Roy and Donna Blackburn came, and they placed their membership already having been baptized. Uh, so they just wanted to partner with us in ministry and what we're doing here at Jefferson, the local church here. And this is Sadie Sneed and her, some of her biggest cheerleaders. And she comes today to give her life to Christ and to be baptized. Uh, yeah, praise the Lord. So we're going to take her confession, and then Pat Paul Jerry's going to go upstairs. We're going to do the baptism upstairs in our baptistry. So we would, we would invite you all. We'd love for you all. Can they come up and celebrate with you? Yeah, that'd be fine. All right, let me take your confession. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I, that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Amen. Let's celebrate. Hey, we're gonna go up and get ready, and then Steve's gonna talk with you guys for a minute. Hey, sorry, just need to take a couple of seconds. I do want to thank you all for your prayers for, for my family over the last couple of weeks. I also have another kind of emotional announcement uh, to make as well. Um, as you may be aware, uh, Chrissy Norris has been with us, goodness, almost 13 years as our uh, children's ministry leader here at Jefferson. She's done an amazing job. She's done uh, a, a fantastic job at building up a, a children's ministry program that's thriving and, and really just a, even a, a big part of what draws people here to Jefferson Church. And we really want to commend her for all that she's done over all of these years. You know this, uh, there, there are really only three ministers that have been here like a real long time, and, and uh, I'm, I'm one of them, and then Jerry Simpkins, and then Chrissy uh, has been here the third longest of any any of our uh, uh, ministry leaders here ever at Jefferson. And so uh, we celebrate that with her, but we also uh, have, have received a resignation from her. Uh, God has called her to a new ministry in Indian Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, it's a great church, thriving church up there, East 91st Street Christian Church up there. And uh, they're a church planning church, just like we're a church planning church. And and so just be in prayer for Chrissy as she moves on to this new chapter and God's call on her life as she moves uh, to Indianapolis. We don't know timelines and all of that yet. So that's all still to be settled. But, you know, word starts to get out. We wanted to make an official announcement so that you would be aware. Uh, be in prayer for Chrissy. Uh, she takes this next step in her, her life and ministry. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll see you next week at... 8.45 or 11, uh, and, and God bless you. Have a great day.